Hello and welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all having a great time and I appreciate you dropping in. Before we get into this, if you're looking for more true crime, make sure you check out the Chilling app. We now have true crime over there, narrated by yours truly. Not to mention we have a bunch of other narrators too, with hundreds of stories. All completely ad-free. You can claim your three-day free trial over on the Chilling app. After those three days, it's only $2.99 per month. And it's completely ad-free. You get to choose all of your ambient noises you want. Rain, fire, all that good stuff. And not to mention, we're doing an Xbox Series X giveaway. So look in the description for more information about that. Oh, I should also mention we added a sleep timer too. So you can actually have the app turn off after a set amount of time so it's not playing all night. As well as being able to have your screen off to save that beautiful battery. And without any further ado, let's begin. Jacob Irwin Wetterling was born on February 17, 1978 in Minnesota. His name became known to the public due to his abduction at the hands of Danny Heinrich when he was just 11 years old on October 22, 1989. That day he was biking home with his younger brother, Trevor, and a friend, Aaron, when Danny ambushed the children and had them lay on the ground. Danny asked each of the children how old they were before letting Trevor and Aaron go. He told them not to look back as they ran off or he would shoot them. Tragically, that was the last time Trevor saw his older brother and Aaron saw his friend. Once Trevor and Aaron reached home, they told their babysitter what had happened. She called her father over and he called 911 to report the abduction. 911 This is Merlin Jerzak calling from Kiwi Court in St. Out in the township. Uh -huh. I'm right now next door to my neighbor, at my neighbor, the Jerry Wetterling family. That's where you're coming? And, uh, some of their boys went down to Tom Thumb to pick up a movie, and on their way back, someone stopped them. We believe that they have one of the boys because the, one of the boys did not come back with them. Okay, were, you, were they picked up in a vehicle? Just a second, I'll ask boys, was there a vehicle there, or was he walking? They couldn't, they didn't see a vehicle. This person appeared on the road when they were bicycling back home. And they don't know where the other friend is at? They don't know where their brother and friend is at. So we're missing two people? There's missing one. Did they see the individual at all? Yes, they did. Did you see the individual at all? He had a mask on. The other dad, dispatch right now is dispatching the squad to where you're at right now, okay? okay. In the meantime, I want to compile as much information as I right. can. What is your name again, sir? My name is Merlin Jerzak, okay. but I am at my neighbor's. And that's Dr. Jerry Wetterling. That's Dr. Jerry Wetterling. Turn him to where we have a screen at, okay? How old is the individual that has not returned? Um, how old is Jacob? Okay. 11. It's Jacob, right? And yes, he's 11. Jacob, Jacob Wetterling. What was Jacob last seen wearing? What was Jacob wearing? 11 year old boy. The male party did have a mask on. No vehicle scene. Uh, he was wearing a red hockey jacket that had police department on it. And it has his name on it. Police department written in back? Police department is on the back. In white letters. In white letters. When was the last time they seen Jacob? Where, uh, Jacob, where, or where was you at? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. It was right at uh, the Urban Trifle house. Hang on just a second. I'm going to be talking with the officers. 
was Jacob riding a bike? Yeah, he was he was riding his 10 speed bike. We're by. The vehicle was seen as party approached him on foot. We're all three of you was riding, a riding a bike at that time. I know where the bicycle was at this time. Well, this is, I think that maybe my best bet is to let Trevor get on the phone and he can describe to you uh, okay. what he's saw and this type of thing. Okay, he understands. Would you advise, no, this is advise of no house numbers, but there, this is a fire number. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, I'll put Trevor on. Okay. And he can, you can, he can answer your question. We've got him pretty well calmed down here. Hello? Trevor? Yes? Yeah. You're talking to the sheriff's office. I want you to give me anything you can, you can recall about this male party that approached you guys. Well, he was, he was like, sort of, he was like a man, sort of big. Well, he was large? Sort of. Okay. And he had like a, he looks sort of like nylon thing as a mask. Do you know what color it was? Black. A black mask? Do you know what color jacket he had on? I think it was black too. Well, did you notice any jeans or anything? Yeah, uh, it looks like a idiot. Trevor, do you know what happened to your friend's bicycle? Um, no, we don't know. Nobody knows what happened to that. Because we had to just, like, run, up, run off into the woods. Okay, you guys ran off into the woods, but nobody knows what happened to Jacob, right? Yeah. Can you think of anything else that the guy have? That what? Did the guy have a deep voice, anything like that, that yeah. you can remember? Did he have, like, a cold voice or whatever? Can you tell me... How big, compared to your dad or somebody, how big would you say this guy was? He was about the size of a male. The guy that you just talked to. Okay, same height, same weight. Yeah, I'm that type of thing. Too. And he had on a black mask and a black jacket. Do you know if the jacket was leather or nylon? Did it have anything written on it? We can't tell because it's so dark. Can I talk to Merlin again real quick? Yes. Merlin, how big are you? <laughs> okay, I'm about 195 pounds, uh -huh. 5 foot 10. I know, that's hard for kids to yes. pinpoint, so I have to try to right. figure out who he looks like. I'm hoping if if Jacob would have ran into the woods or something, if he would have gotten lost or something, do they know if he actually had contact with Jacob? Yes, they, they, they just told me that the uh, guy... Uh, got a hold of Jacob and told them to run into the woods. He told the other two boys to run into the woods. Did they see any weapons at all or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Guns, knives. He had a pistol. 2,500, 2,500 times. He had guys who were out saying that he did have some type of handgun stand by for additional. Can I talk to Trevor again? Yes, hold on. Hello? Trevor, did you see the gun the individual had? Um, we couldn't really see it, but we just sort of thought. Okay, did he threaten you? Okay, do you guys see squad cars outside the residence? Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Bye now. Bye. Danny already had a criminal past at the time he abducted Jacob. He had also dropped 60 pounds before kidnapping Jacob so that he could gain it back later and avoid getting caught by authorities. At the time, there were reports of a man trying to kidnap children. And just a year before Jacob's abduction, another child fell victim to Danny just 10 miles away from where he captured Jacob. It took months for the authorities to make significant headway in their investigation. The FBI suspected Danny and brought him in for questioning in December of 1989. Danny said he could not remember where he was the day Jacob was abducted. After taking a DNA test, they let him go. A year later, the FBI had interviewed 2,000 people, but were no closer to finding out who had kidnapped Jacob. The case went cold for years. It wasn't until 2015 that the authorities finally figured out it was Danny all along. A DNA match linked him to a crime against another young boy that had occurred 10 months before Jacob went missing. The authorities also searched his home and discovered child pornography. In 2016, Danny finally confessed to the kidnapping, molestation, and murder of Jacob. He also told the authorities where they could find Jacob's body. 
All of this information was gained through a plea deal. Danny was sentenced to 20 years for his crimes, many of which the charges were dropped as per the agreement. Danny will be eligible for release in 2033 at the age of 70. John Formisano was an experienced cop, starting out in Newark, New Jersey way back in 1995. He married Christy Solaro in 2010. They had two children together, a daughter and a son. It is not clear why John and Christy's relationship deteriorated, but in June of 2019, John filed for divorce. Not much is known about his personal life, but colleagues have stated that apart from dealing with his divorce, John was also preoccupied with his mother who was gravely ill. About a month later, John stopped at Christie's house to drop off a pair of eyeglasses for his kids. While he was at the house, he got suspicious that there was someone else there and went upstairs to Christie's bedroom only to find she was in there with another man. Christie had actually warned her boyfriend that John was passing by. When he arrived, she left the bedroom and locked it behind her. When she saw John approaching her room with a gun, she cried out for her boyfriend, who remains unidentified, to call the police. But it was too late. John was already firing at his ex-wife. He then broke down her bedroom door and fired at her boyfriend. Christy ran out of the house and was gunned down on the way to her neighbor's home. Several calls were made to 911 that day from neighbors who had heard the gunshots and others who saw Christy being shot dead out in the street. Now one person just comes out, it's your emergency. Hey, hi, I live at in the, in the White Rock section and a man just shot his wife in front of my house. He just what? You gotta hurry up because he is dying in front of my house, please. Okay, ma'am, that's five. What, what town are you in, ma'am? Right off of, Oak, right off of White Rock Boulevard, please. Okay. The Newark cop, he's a, he's, he's a Newark cop, he lives on the corner. He's okay. daughter. I saw him. I saw him through my window. Okay, ma'am, ma'am, hold on. Take a deep breath for me, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uniform on. Okay, give me one second, all right? He's dying in front of my house. I'm. I'm. I have to contact Jefferson, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Yes. Hurry up, please. One second, okay? Bye. 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 What's going on today? What's who? Who is this? It's Jefferson County Police Department. There's somebody shot on my front steps, but on your front steps. Yeah, she's, I think she's dying or dead. I, I don't really want to touch her. We heard some pops, and I think it's the woman from two doors. Who's next door? She's the reporting a woman's on the front steps. No, you, you better just no, really. I'm not reporting. I'm just doing the whole thing. You're on the cops. I don't know. All right. Stand by. Stand by. Hey, I'm my neighbors here. Stand by. Go ahead. Yeah. You guys better hurry up. I think it was my neighbor. Food. I'm getting up around. Like, really? You better hurry up. I'm sending everybody first. You better, because I think I'm going to stop my neighbor. The authorities found John in a nearby neighborhood about two hours later. The gun he had used in the shooting was in the car. When he saw the police, he discarded his phone. He was charged with murder and a range of other crimes, including endangering the welfare of a child, but maintained his innocence, claiming he experienced a blackout before the shooting began. After his arrest, he was transferred to a psychiatric facility where he awaited his trial. He had turned down a plea agreement that would have given him 40 years, and was later found competent to stand trial. Unfortunately, Christy did not survive the shooting, whereas her boyfriend was transferred to a medical facility for treatment. He had gunshot wounds in his thigh, his arms, and his abdomen. Thankfully, the two children didn't get hurt and were sent away to live with an uncle after the tragedy occurred. From everything I can find, this case is still ongoing, so I don't know the final outcome yet. Yaval Lerman was just 23 years old and working as a locksmith when he was called to Millwork's apartment in Atlanta to open a door. 
Yuval arrived and requested that the man who had called him identify himself, which the man wouldn't do, so Yuval refused to open the door. Unfortunately, the man had a gun, and since Yuval would not give in to his demands, he shot Yuval. Uh,
they stop here, I guess. I'm not too sure. But um, if you think you can, can you send a, uh, an ambulance here at 1800 Howe Mill Road? Okay. Where's the patient going to be located here? Uh, right in the lobby. They just took a seat. He seems to be bleeding from his arm. I'm not sure what happened. Says a male, correct? Uh, yes. The authorities arrived just in time to transfer Yuval to a hospital where he was later reported to be in stable condition. Yuval's experience with gun violence was just one of many during the same period in Atlanta. As a result, the authorities contemplated a security force that would be tasked with handling gun violence at night. Yuval's shooter was never apprehended. Once again, I really appreciate you taking the time to check out this video. Oh, and if you enjoy the series, make sure to leave a like or dislike or subscribe if you're not subscribed already to. It means a lot to me that you guys enjoy this series as much as I do, so appreciate you sticking around with me. And I will catch you in the next one. And just remember, it's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye.